singing tonight. Get your Bibles, please. I want you to mark Psalm 5. Psalm, find Psalm 5 and mark that for a little later on in the message. And then turn to 1 Chronicles 29. Psalm 5 and 1 Chronicles 29. This morning you all got the sun tanning booth over here this morning. Now I guess it had been over here, but we'll get done. We'll get done before dark, I think. And so uh, what a joy. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for being faithful. Be in prayer for our nation. Oh, our nation needs such prayer. The division and the divisiveness, the bitterness, the hatred, as well as the healing that's needed physically as well. Pray for our church. Uh, these are, and all the good, solid Bible preaching churches, it's a tough time for the churches. It's a tough time for the people. It just is. And so we need to understand that and keep that in prayer and do everything we can to strengthen God's work and to be what God would have us to be. Tonight I'm preaching on part two, if you will, of As For Me. As For Me. We saw this morning, As For Me, about serving God. Very a common passage, a tremendous passage. But looking tonight at two vital commitments to Christian living as for me there are several the Bible has I said about a year and a half well three years three and a half years ago I preached a series on as for me these are different thoughts but two vital commitments to Christian living based upon God's word where it says as for me so as we look at these tonight it will be a help so let's just make the decision that as for me first Chronicles 29 and in verse number the wind keeps turning my pages. There we go. Verse number 16. We'll be looking at other verses in this passage, but two just simple ones tonight as we get started. First Chronicles 29, verse number 16. O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee a house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and has pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. Father, we ask you to help us tonight. Thank you for these good folks that are here. Thank you for folks that are watching faithfully by live stream that are not able to join us yet. But, Father, I ask that you send that revival we've been praying for. We need to see you working. We need to see your hand upon our church. We need to see your hand upon our lives. We need to feel your spirit moving within us. Again, I thank you for this morning, the good services, and tonight, the folks that are able to be here. So, Lord, I ask that you, again, like you did this morning, bind Satan. There'll be no excessive distractions while we're outside and holy spirit you would have free reign in our in our hearts and in our mind lord help me be as brief as i can two simple thoughts but very basic thoughts two vital thoughts tonight and for most folks here this is a review but lord we are all on the edge of trying times difficult times unique times and Father, you still have a work for our church. You still have a work for us. You're still on the throne. And Lord, you've not lost one step of yourself. You've not lost one bit of power. But Lord, you've still got all things in control. So open our minds and our hearts to your vision for us, your desire for us, and let us be what we need to be in this desperate time, in these perilous times, in these joyful times to serve you. For our God, I ask that you bless us.
Your Bibles are still open there to First Chronicles 29. Again, we saw this morning, as for me, as for me, and we saw about serving. We talk about commitment. We talk about making a personal decision, and that's what it's about, personal decisions. And we saw a tremendous passage this morning again about how Joshua said, as for me and my house. One of the advantages of doing live stream is the message tonight is, yes, it's for us that are here, but it's also for those that are not here. And so I'm going to pray that for those that are watching by live stream and those that will be watching later, that their off switch will break off. All right, so when they get to this part and the Holy Spirit begins to speak to them, they say, whoop, I can't turn it off, can't turn it off. Let the Holy Spirit keep working. So it's for us tonight, but also for those that may be watching by live stream. Tonight, looking at two critical commitments, the Bible talks about as for me. In my younger years, I would have, and maybe still will again, preach these two points very hard. But rather tonight, I'd like to preach it from the heart, and to the heart. I've certainly not arrived in these. I've certainly not been everything I should have been in these areas that we're seeing tonight. But God did do a work in my heart somewhere along the way to brought these things to be important to me. Though I may not as be as successful in them as I would like, I may not be as focused on them as I would like, but God has done a work in my heart along my Christian life, my early part of my Christian life, to make these things important to me. And because he has done that, I'm praying he'll do the same for you. You may be here not because it's important, but because it's habit. But I want us to, to get that into our hearts. And for those who are watching by live stream, I hope we can get it into your heart. And it's one of those things, or these things we look talk about tonight, that I can't force it upon you. I don't even know how to communicate it like I'd like to. So it's going to have to be the Holy Spirit. But as these things have worked in my heart and in many of your hearts, I know it's been there and I can see it in your life. I don't know how it got there except God placed it there. I don't know how it got into my heart except God has placed it there. But I have a desire and I have a hunger and I know that God has a desire that you'd have it in your hearts also. So tonight we're looking at two simple but two critical commitments we need to make as for me. There are many others in the Bible. We're just looking at two tonight. Two points. Can you believe that? All right, two points tonight. As for me. And they go along with what we saw this morning, where we saw it said, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land we dwell. But as for me and my house, 
we will serve the Lord. Two critical, fundamental things we're looking at tonight in the Christian life. Two vital things, two simple things for our life, for our church, and for souls. And without these two, without these two as for me's in our church, without these two as for me in our lives, the work of God gets crippled. Our Christian life becomes weakened. It ceases. So I'm looking forward tonight to letting God take these two things, as for me, to light a fire in us for Lighthouse Baptist Church to be some folks that will say, a church that will say, as for me, as for me as a church, as for me as a family, as for me as individuals, we'll put these two commitments into our lives as common as only the Holy Spirit can make it. So tonight, are you with me tonight? Not going to be long. Two simple things, two simple commitments that you and I need to make, you and I need to be on guard about, you and I need to pray for that our church and other Christians would find these two simple things. So with it tonight, looking back at our text, in 1 Chronicles 29, if the wind will quit playing games with my Bible, there we go. Verse 17, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart, and thou hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. First of all, tonight, as for me, we see, the psalmist David here said, as for me, I find joy in giving. I find joy in giving. What is it, class? I find joy in what? Giving. Giving. Yes, we're talking about giving. I hope you want to have joy in giving. I hope you want to have more joy in giving. Because as a child of God, we've got to give. As a child of God, we're commanded to give. As a child of God, it's our place to give. As a child of God, it's our opportunity to give. We might as well find joy in giving it. Boy, don't you hate it when you get miserable about giving? Don't you hate it when the IRS time comes and you have to pay your taxes? I don't know of anybody who joyfully gives to the IRS. Now, as many of the folks in the media would make it sound like we ought to be giving more, but I don't think that they... What was it? Just a, last year, a few years ago, they set up a fund that you could give more taxes. You just write them a check and give it to the government. I think they got like $300 from the whole nation. People don't want to voluntarily give extra taxes. Well, we find here that we find David saying, as for me, he said, I find joy in giving. I want to find joy in giving. I want my giving to be more joyful. I want my giving to be more delightful. I want my giving to be something that brings me more joy. And we can find that tonight. That's what David said, as for me. And we're going to see how we're going to have that, as for me, joy in giving. God wants us to have joy in giving. That's why in 2 Chronicles 9, 6, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, let him so give, not grudgingly, not I have to, not because I must, or of necessity, because if I don't, the lights get turned out. For God loveth a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. We need to learn tonight to say, as for me, I'm going to find joy in giving. Because the more joy we have in giving, the more we can give. And the more we give in joy, we will have more joy. So I want you to notice, we need, just need to understand that we find that joy in giving. I started to put this because this morning we saw, as for me in my house, we're talking about serving. So tonight I almost put, for me, in my, as for me, I'm going to sacrifice. But sacrifice, though we are to sacrifice, so God's given us an example of sacrifice. Sacrifice to and for God is no sacrifice. Are you listening to me? Yes, it is a sacrifice as far as we give up something. But sacrifice to God and sacrifice for God is not sacrifice. It is, in fact, reasonable service. Are you listening to me? Sacrifice is not sacrifice. It's what class? reasonable service. And then we hear that passage all the time. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So the next time the devil says that's too much of a sacrifice, you say it's not too much of a sacrifice. It's reasonable service. And the next time you begin to feel in your heart, oh, I'm so sacrificing so much for God. I'm giving up so much for God. No, it's reasonable service. And so we see tonight this idea of finding joy in giving 
because it's just reasonable service, but also it's received blessings. As we give, God promises to give us more blessings. In Malachi 3.10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. I like that phrase. God makes it real clear where the tithe is supposed to go. It's called storehouse tithing. I preach on it and teach on it, and it ought to be taught because we have a lot of people that do not understand and do not believe in what storehouse tithing is. There it is. Let's just take a detour. It says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. All the tithes. All the 10%. All the first 10%. That there may be meat in my house. So there he says, the storehouse is my house. God's house. The house of God. The church. So the tithe belongs to the Lord. And he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. We, you can give money to wherever you want to, but the tithe needs to come into the storehouse. It's called storehouse tithing. He says, bring it in. He says, that way you'll be poor and you'll do without. That's not what he says. That there may be meat in my house. He said, you bring the tithes in so the house can go on. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God says, you prove me, you try me. So when we talk about having joy in giving, we can have that joy in giving because it's not a sacrifice, it's reasonable service, and it's not a sacrifice, it's in fact a received blessing from God. And here we find David who learned, he said, as for me, he said, I found joy in giving. Say it with me, class. Joy in giving. Joy in giving. Put a little joy in that. As for me, I found joy in giving. Oh, hilarious, joyful, excited giving. Very quickly, let's notice first of all. Joy of giving is found in the condition of the heart. Joy in our giving is found in the condition of the heart. Back in our text in First Chronicles 29, verse number 17. Psalm that said, or David said, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart. He tries the heart. It's a tried heart. He's talking about giving. He's talking about having joy of all these things. He says, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things. So the idea, he found this joy in giving, and we'll see that joy as talks about in these other verses, because of the condition of the heart. It always comes back to our hearts. It always comes back to that, that who we are on the inside. It's a tried heart. God, he says, you try the hearts. God looks at our hearts. God examines our hearts. It's having a right heart that helps us have that joy in giving. David had the, his heart tried. God looked at his heart. God knew his heart. That's why in Acts 13, he tells us the heart that David had. And it said, when he had removed him, he raised up unto him Dave, them David to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. He was a man after God's own heart. We know David had a giving heart because he had God's heart. By the way, God's heart is a giving heart. If we're going to have a heart like God, it's going to be a heart that gives. It's going to be a heart that sacrifices. It's going to be a heart that willingly opens up. It's a tried heart. God tries our heart. He tries our hearts by trials. He tries our hearts by toil. He tries our hearts by test. And here he says, David says, you try the hearts. He said, I know you're trying my heart. I know you're looking into our hearts. I know you're examining our hearts in this idea of giving. So joy is found in giving because of the condition of heart. It's a tried heart and it's a true heart. We're, if we're going to have joy in our giving, it's going to be a heart that God has tried. It's going to be a heart that God has looked at. It's going to be a heart that God has, has worked on, but it's also going to be a true heart. Look at verse 17 again. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and I have seen with joy thy people. The uprightness. God has pleasure in uprightness. And he said in the uprightness of his heart, he is willingly given. The word upright means right. It means straight. It means true. 
See, we're going to have joy in giving when our heart has been tried by God, and we'll have joy in giving when our heart is true. We won't have joy in giving when our heart is not true. We won't have joy in giving when our heart is not pure. We will not have joy in giving when we're not upright in heart. We think of some folks in the Bible. I was speaking with somebody just the other day in Acts 5.3. We have people by the name of uh, Ananias and Sapphira. They did not have a true heart. They did not have an honest heart. They did not have a sincere heart. And so their giving, no doubt, was not joyful. In Acts 5, we know the story. And Peter said, remember they had sold the property? One man had sold some property and brought all the money and gave it to the church. People were excited about that. People lauded him for that. And so Ananias and Sapphira decided they wanted to get in on the same deal, but they weren't willing. They did not have a heart to give. They were not true in their heart. And so they came and gave part of the money, which was fine, except they pretended it was all the money. They said, this is all the money that we got from the property. This is all the money, and we're giving it all. It says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied to men, but to God. So again, Satan filled their heart, and they conceived this thing in their heart. If we're going to have joy in giving, if we're going to rejoice in our giving, if we're going to be like David here, we're going to have to make sure, yes, our hearts are tried, letting God look into it, but they also have to be true. It also have to be honest. We also have to be real and true and upright and straight in our life. That's why in Malachi 3, back where it talked about the storehouse tithing, will a man rob God? Ye have robbed me, but you say, wherein have you robbed me? And he says, in tithes and offerings. See, we're not going to have joy in giving if we're a thief. We're not going to have joy in giving if we're robbing from God. We're not going to have joy in giving if we're keeping back what belongs to God. I want to have a joyful heart. I want to have joy in giving. But here we find David said, as for me, in uprightness of heart, in a tried heart, in a pure heart, he said, I willingly give all these things. And he talks about his joy and the joy of the people in the giving. Well, I tell you what, let's keep our hearts right. Let's be honest. Let's don't rob from God. Let's not steal from God in His offerings. Now, I know folks here, I don't always, I don't look at the offerings that are given, but I always hold the right to. Certain things do come across my desk, but I don't look and examine so I can have freedom to preach like tonight. But if we're members of our church and members of, of this church and of this body, and we're not tithing, and we're giving 20 bucks a month or 20 bucks a year, and we spend more than that at the ice cream store every week, God forgive us. Amen. David said, in my uprightness of heart. Well, I want to have joy in giving. Then let's be right. Let's be upright. Let's be honest with God. Let's be true with God and not be a thief and not be a liar. So we find it's a condition of the heart that allows us to have joy in giving as for me. So it's a tried heart. It's a true heart. But here's the key. It is a tender heart a tender heart. If we're going to have joy in giving, if our hearts are going to be have that joy as we give unto God, as for me, it's going to be because we have a tender heart. Look, if you would, back in our text in First uh, Chronicles 29 and in verse number 3. Backing up, we didn't read the entire passage. He says, moreover, he's talking about he's prepared giving. He's got all the instruments ready for the temple that Solomon's going to build. God said David couldn't build it. He said, your son will. But David then went and started getting all the things ready and making all the preparations and giving all the money and all the gold and all the silver and all the instruments. He was given all that he could. Verse number 3, when he talks about that preparation, he says, moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of God. A tender heart. See, if our hearts are tender... We'll have joy in giving. Just like in your home, as, as mothers, you have a tender heart toward your children. You do not begrudge giving them. You do not begrudge sacrificing for them. You don't begrudge giving up a little sleep for them. You don't begrudge sacrificing a little instrument in your house or some time in your house. No, you joyfully do it. Why? Because you have tender. You've set your compassion upon them. You've set your affections upon them. And you have a heart tender toward them. Husbands and wives, have, if your hearts are tender one toward another, you don't mind giving to them. You joy 
joy in giving them. It's a pleasure to give unto them. It's an exciting thing to be able to sacrifice and give unto them. But when our hearts are not tender, when our hearts are hardened, when our hearts are, are given to something else, then we do begin to begrudge. We do begin to then be squeamish about giving and not have joy in giving. In Malachi 6, or Matthew 6, rather, verse number 20, Jesus says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You say, Preacher, my heart's not there. Then put some treasures behind it. Give. It's an ongoing cycle. As you give, you'll have more heart for it. As you have more heart for it, you'll give for it. It's one of those escalating, one of those cascading things till finally you get to the place where not just you'll just not just joy in giving, but you'll have a desire, I wish I could give more. You say, I just don't have any more to give. I don't have any resources to give. But if I had one prayer, prayer and one joy and one desire it'd be that I could give more why because that's where my heart is David had a tender heart now we can give without loving but you can't love without giving it's just part of the nature is how God has made us joy in giving is the condition of the heart let's make sure that we're giving now again, I don't know what brought that on in my life, but somehow either by just following the Scriptures or the work of the Holy Spirit, there's a desire in my heart to be able to give. I, you say, Preacher, I don't have that desire. I'd sure be going to God and asking for it. It ought to be as for me. So joy in giving was found in the condition of the heart. Joy in giving was found through the conduct of the will. Through the conduct of the will. In other words, he just decided he was going to do it. Have you figured it out? Things don't happen unless you decide to do it. It's just, it's just a will. You just have to will to do it. First of all, he purposed to give. He just purposed to give. Back in our text in verse 17. I know also that my God has tried the heart and has pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And he just purposed to give. He said, I've willingly offered. This is what I'm going to do. I made up my mind I'm going to give. If we don't decide, it's not going to happen. See, if we're going to have this joy in giving, it's only going to be because we go ahead and give. So I want joy in giving. All right, start giving. Well, I don't have any joy. Are you doing any giving? Here it is. He purposed to give. Not only did he just purpose to give. By the way, that's what you have to do. I'm gone. Not only do you just have purpose to give, we need to decide, I'm just going to do it. You just have to plan it out. You just have to anticipate it. You just have to make sure that you do it. So you purpose to give, and then he prepared to give. There we go, thank you. He prepared to give. Look at verse number 2 of our text. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for things to be made of gold, and the silver of things of silver and the brass for things of brass, the iron for things of iron, the wood for things of wood, the oxen onyx stones and stones to be set, glistening stones and divers colors and all manner of precious stones. And on he goes and he talks over and over about how he prepared to give. Prepared to give. So this idea of doing with the will, it's preparing to give. You have to prepare to give. It doesn't happen unless you prepare. You say, what are you talking about? That means you go ahead and lay out the tithe first. That means you do that first. You don't see what's left over. You don't see how things are going to go. Well, I'll give if, if, I, if I can, if I have anything left. No, we do it first. We prepare to give. You plan it. You schedule it. You condition. You can consider it. And if I prepare to give, we're going to have joy in giving. You want joy in giving? That's what the psalmist, he said, as for me, I found joy in giving. He prepared to give, and then he partnered to give. He partnered to give. Back in our text, verse 17. And I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. Notice what he says. And now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly 
unto thee. He said, I was willingly offering and I had joy. He said, but I tell you another exciting joy. He said, I have joy in seeing the other people, more of your people, right here, gathered together, willingly giving also. It's an exciting thing to give together. It's an exciting thing to know that you're not the only one giving. It's an exciting thing to see God's people gathering together and giving together. Look at verse number 9. Then the people rejoiced. Why did they rejoice? For that they offered willingly. There's joy in offering willingly. There's joy in giving. And so he partnered with the people. It was David giving, but that was just setting an example. And as his example and as his challenge, then the other people started giving also. What would it, You just can't imagine how God could bless and what God could provide if all of God's people would willingly give the tithes and the offerings. It would be an amazing thing. You're looking at me like calves in a new gate. Uh, I don't know if I like these masks or not. I can't see. But he partnered in his giving. What an exciting thing that the people would rejoice and they offered willingly. Look at verse 17 again. We'll come back to that a little later. So we've got to find joy in giving. David said, as for me, he said, I've willingly given it. Let's learn to just say, as for me, whether anybody else does, as for me, I'm going to give unto the Lord. I'm going to give God his due. I'm going to give God his tithe. I'm going to offer unto God. Boy, it's an exciting thing that when we can give to God. He said, as for me, we just have to decide, I'm going to have joy in giving. Turn to Psalm 5. We find the second thing tonight, the last thing tonight, about as for me, two critical things. We have to be critical in the fact that we just have to decide, as for me, I'm going to have joy in giving. But secondly, as for me, I'm going to come to church. As for me, I'm going to come to church. Now, I'm glad you're here. Amen. Good. you got to be a little louder. We're outside. All right. So... We got to come to church. For those that are watching, I understand right now with the pandemic that some folks are not comfortable. Some folks, it's wise for them to stay. But, ladies and gentlemen, when it makes it easy for us to come, when we're healthy enough to come, when the government says we can come and we ought to come anyway, we ought to decide I'm just going to be in God's house. It's real easy to fall away from coming to God's house. It's real easy to fall away from making it a routine. It's real easy for us not to make it just part of our life. Yeah, we're going to find the psalmist here. He says, "He as for me, he says." I'm going to church. Psalm chapter 5. Let me read the passage for you, beginning with verse number 1. Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak lacing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. I like that. In verse number 7, he says, But as for me, I will come into thy house. He says, as for me, he says, I'm going to church. As for me, I'm going to be always in God's house. As for me, I'm going into God's house. We just have to decide to go to God's house. That is so basic and so critical and so simple that when Christians are Christians, they go to church. It's just, that's what Christians do. We go to God's house. It's all throughout the Bible. And again, I don't know what God did in my heart somewhere along the way when I first got saved. I don't know if it was just the preaching of the Word. I don't know if it was just the Word itself. I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit. But God put something in my mind and God put something in my spirit. God put something in my soul. God put something in my heart that I want to be in God's house. It wasn't because I had to. It wasn't because of necessity. It wasn't because it was just something that you were required to do. But God put something in my heart and God put something in my spirit that I want to be with God's people and in God's house and I made the decision like the psalmist here did he said as for me as for me look again at Psalm 5 but as for me I will come into thy house 
how simple it is. Very quickly, as for me, I'm going to go to church. As for me, I'm going to come to church. We have to decide that or will not come. First of all, we find it's a right destination. It's a right destination. It's a decision he made. He said, I'm going to go to God's house. It's a right destination. Notice what he says there. Verse number 7, but as for me, I will come into thy house. He said, I'm going to go to God's house. I'm glad he had the right destination in mind. I'm glad he had the right direction in mind. This idea of destination, thy house. We know in the Old Testament it was the tabernacle or it was the temple, but still it was God's house. The synagogues in the New Testament where they went to God's house, where they met with God, where they worshiped God, where they spent time with God, he went to the house, God's house. In the New Testament, that's the church. The New Testament church. We talk about going to church. Now, we are the church. And as the church, it's a called out assembly. We know what that means. Ecclesia. All throughout the New Testament, it's a called out assembly. In all but one or two places in the New Testament, it's obviously very clear. It's talking about a local assembly of God's people. And it's written, all the New Testament, all the epistles are written to the church at, to the churches at. It's the right destination, a called out assembly. So we being the church, we are the called out assembly. We are called out and we're called out to assemble. We get together. And that's what the, here David says in the Old Testament. He's talking about, I'm going to go to your house. We have to decide we're going to go out to the house. Colossians 1.18, talking about Christ. He is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he might have the preeminence. We're talking about going to God's house. And again, in the New Testament, we're talking about going to church. Not the building, though that's where we're gathering right now. Right now, we're gathering out underneath the tree. We come to church. We didn't come to the building, but we've come together. We've come to the church. We not need to find, as for me, I'm going to be in church. You now, let me help you with something. When we talk about going to church, we're not talking about going to TV. You know, again, I understand the pandemic. I understand folks that are not comfortable. I'm not criticizing for that. But I'm saying it's real easy. Well, I hear it all the time. My church is on TV. That's not church. That's not church. I'm glad we can do it this way, and I'm glad folks are coming to church as they can on with the technology. But we're talking about getting the church as we can. It's not church. It's not Church is not TV. Church is not DVD. Church is not BSF alone. I sign folks, I say, do you go to church and wait? Well, I go to BSF, Bible Study Fellowship. That's not church. That's not church. It's not BSF alone. It's not Gideon's Club alone. Are you listening to me? It's church. Christ didn't die for those other things. He died for the church. It's not family camp. It's church we're talking about. And so we're talking about, as for me, he said, I'm going to go to your house. For us, it's, as for me, we're going to church. We know in Hebrews 10, 23, and again, you're here tonight, so you ought to just, there ought to be a lot of amens tonight. Amen. Oh, yes, amen, because we're in church. But we just have to decide, as for me, I'm going to be in church. It's part of my life. It's part of my existence. It's so critical. I'm just going to make sure I'm there. Hebrews 10, 23, we know the passage. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and the good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching let's examine that just a little bit because we miss some of that when we go in preacher will get up and say forsake not the assembling of yourselves together means come to church that's by the way that's what it means come to church but there's so much in that so it says not forsaking the word forsaking there in the Greek means to leave behind in some place. I mean, just leaving it behind. See, the idea, we get the idea of forsaken. Well, I've not forsaken it because I still have a membership there. I'm not forsaken it because I send some money there sometimes. I've not forsaken it because I still claim it as mine. That's not what it's saying. It says you just, not forsaking means don't leave it behind. Real easy to leave behind church. That's why it burdens my heart so much when I see folks that lay out for different reasons for after just a couple of weeks. You know in your life, for those that haven't been here with the AV for every single service, you know how easy it is to get comfortable not 
getting up and getting dressed and coming down. You say, well, I get the preaching. That's great, but that's not the assembling together because there's more to it than just the preaching. There's more to it than just the giving. It's the assembling of together. He says, forsake not. Don't leave it behind. When you go on vacation, don't leave it behind. When you go visit family, don't leave it behind. When you're going off into some resort somewhere, don't leave it behind. The whole idea is when you're out somewhere else, do not leave behind the house of God. That's why you need to be in God's house wherever you go, whenever you go, and find it. Do not forsake it because you skip one. Everybody in here, out here tonight knows when you miss one, it's easy to miss the second. When you miss two, it's much easier to miss the third one. When you miss four, and pretty soon it's been weeks or months. Whole goal is we find here, he said, as for me, he said, I'm going to your house. He had the right destination. He said, that's where I'm going to go. So forsaking, don't leave it behind. But notice what it says about it. Coming to church in this passage is holding fast our faith. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And then we've got some parentheses. For He is faithful to promise. Let us consider one another, provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. When I forsake the assembling of ourselves together, when I skip church, when I forsake church, I am losing my profession of faith. Coming to church, that's what it says. Hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering. And he goes on, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. In other words, by me coming to church, that's the profession of my faith. By me coming to church, I say I am a child of God. By me going to God's house and saying it's my house and it's my church, that's the profession of my faith. You say, well, I'm saved. Then one of the questions I always come and ask is, where are you going to church? Because it is the profession of our faith. So it's holding fast our faith. It's holding fast the profession or the testimony of our faith. It is for the fellowship with the saints. Let us consider one another to provoke unto good works. Coming to church isn't just sitting there listening and it isn't just sitting there giving. It is encouraging one another, considering, provoking, and exhorting. And so much the more. The right destination. He said, as for me, he said, I'm going to your house. He said, God, as for me, I'm going to be there. So we've got the right destination. Then we've got the right decision. He simply said, I will come. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Why don't we decide tonight? I'm just going to do it. You're here tonight, so you've already decided that for tonight. But Wednesday night, you're not just, you need to decide, I'm going to do it. Next Sunday, unless I'm providentially hindered, in other words, unless God stops me, I'm coming. Just put it down. I will. I will. I will. You say, why? Because that's a profession of my faith. Why? Because I love God. Why? Because this is where I belong. Why? Because I love God's people. Why? Why? Because I want to encourage and I want to build up. I don't know how what God did in my heart some years ago to do that, but I hope it's working in you, and I think it is in most of you the same way. Man, church is just where I belong. There is no question. There's no if, ands, or buts. Our kids for 20 years never, never ask, are we going to church today? Never ask on Sunday morning, are we going to Sunday school and church? Never ask on Sunday night whether we're going to church. And I'm not talking about since I was pastor either. This is long before I was pastor. Never once on a Wednesday night say we're going to church. Never once question that on revival time. Never question it at all. On vacation, it was not are we going, it's where we're going. And we went to some unusual places. Well, I remember going to the Grand Canyon, trying to find a church on Wednesday night near the Grand Canyon. It was hard pressed. But see, our kids never ask, will we? They never asked to stay home because they knew it was not going to happen. As for me, we just decide. He said, I will. It's as simple as that. And you'd be surprised how much easier it is once you've made the decision. I will. I will. The struggle. You'll be surprised once you've made the decision and once you've followed it up a few times by making some quote-unquote sacrifices, the devil quits putting so many roadblocks in your way. If he knows it shouldn't take much to knock you out, he's going to knock you out. Mm -hmm. If he knows all it takes is somebody to knock on your door, somebody you haven't seen in a while and you're going to visit, he'll have somebody come by and knock on your door. And you, you'd be surprised how many things would just fall into place once the devil realizes that you've already decided, I will go to thy house. Oh, amen. Maybe you've known it, maybe not. But oh, as for me, as for me, it was the right destination, it's the right decision, and it was the right desire the right desire and that's got to be key again it's a heart issue it's a heart issue here we find he says 
as for me. It was a desire in his heart. That's why David, the psalmist who wrote that there, said in Psalm 122.1, I was glad. He was what? Glad. glad. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. When they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He said, I was glad. He didn't say I was just agreeable. He didn't say, all right, I'll go. He said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 84.10, David said, for, I, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. He said, I'd rather spend one day in God's house than a thousand outside of God's house. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. In other words, he said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper at the house of God. I'd rather be working at the house of God. I'd rather be an usher at the house of God than to live it up with the world. He said, that's my choice. If I have a choice of living it up to going on vacation, to having all these things, or just spending a time with the house of God, he said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. There was a desire a desire to be in the house of God. I don't know how to put that in people. I don't know how God helps me stay right with that in my heart. But there's a desire to be in the house of God. We ought to make that. It's so critical. As for me, he said, I'm going to go to your house. So there was a right destination, a right direction, a right desire. And then there's the right devotion. The right devotion. Back in Psalm 5. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. It wasn't church just because it was church. It was because it was God's church. Because it was God's house. It's because of what they did there in God's house because of the devotion to God that did it. I want you to notice, first of all, it was a responsive devotion. A responsive devotion. Verse 7, But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I, what class? Worship toward thy holy temple. A responsive devotion. He came to worship. He came to worship. He didn't come, and I'm not scolding. I'm just trying to help us understand what goes on. He didn't come to watch. He came to worship. See, it's all in our mind. It's all in our spirit. It's all in our attitude when we come to church, how and why we're coming to church. He said, as for me, he said, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be in your house, but I'm going to worship, not just watching. If we're just watching, there won't be spontaneous amens. There'll be no hanky-waving. There'll be no excitement. You're just watching. Because see, if you're just watching, i got news for you. This is, this, this is not a surprise to you. If you're just looking to be watching church, you can watch better churches on television. We don't have a big band. We don't have a big orchestra. True, you had the most handsome pastor. <laughs> there's some great preaching on television. I know that. There's some rotten preaching, wrong preaching, but there's some good preaching on television. But we don't come to watch. We come to worship. We come to res be responsive. He said, as for me, he said, I'm coming to your house, but I'm coming to worship. It's not just watching. It's not just wandering. It's not just waiting for it to be over. It's a responsive devotion to worship. Notice what he says there. Let's back up to verse number 4. It says, For thou art not a God, verse 4, that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. See, we're coming into worship, but we're coming in responsively because of God's mercy. 
because of God's grace. Because you understand, when we look about the foolish, yes, we are foolish. But by God's grace and God's mercy, He saved us, and we're not part of the foolish. We're not part of the wicked. He saved us and gives us the privilege. He gives us the opportunity. He gives us the joy of coming to His house. He said, I'm coming. He said, I know about the wicked. I know you have no part with the wicked. I know that the foolish you will not stand before you. He says, but as for me, in the multitude of the mercies, we're gathered here tonight by the mercy of God. I'm able to stand behind this pulpit because of the mercy of God. We're able to sing praises unto Him tonight together because of the mercies of God. We're able to open up and read our Bibles because of the mercy of God. We're able to sing His praises and worship Him who's high and holy because of the mercies of God. He said, as for me, he said, I'm coming to your house. Why? Because I want to worship. But it's only because of your mercy. When we realize that coming to church is such a privilege, such a joy because of the mercy and grace of Almighty God, we'll be excited to come because it is our privilege. It is our joy. It is our opportunity. The lost, yes, they could come, but they have no desire to come. They can't come and worship God because they have no have God in them, but we do. And so we have this responsive devotion to the house of God to come and worship. What a great opportunity. But not only a responsive devotion, but a reverence devotion. Notice what he says. Verse number 7, But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Talked about the fear of God this morning. In fear, reverence, the holiness of the temple, the holiness of God. Boy, I'm glad we can come to church and have fun. I'm glad we can come to church and fellowship and laugh. That's side issues. There's holiness in the temple. There's the fear of God and His worship. This morning we saw, as for me and my house, we're going to serve. Tonight, just two critical things that we need to be reminded of. As for me, I'm going to find joy in giving. David said, I saw the joy of the people as they gave and that drilled his heart. He said, I've willingly gave all these things. Boy, let's just... As for me, I'm going to find joy in giving. I'm not going to begrudge. I'm not going to be a tightwad. I'm going to give. And I'm going to enjoy it. And as for me, going to church. Going to church. I'm not going to forsake it. I'm not going to leave it out. Wow. So simple. So critical, though. As for me. Let's bow our heads.